On behalf of Phyllis and the family, I want to thank you all for coming today to celebrate the life of Tunis and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ through Tunis. Just a reminder that uh, God holds Tunis precious in his life. And scripture tells us in Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We know that joy and we know that happiness that when we're precious to the Lord, that he will let nothing harm us, nothing will pass through us except what he wants to happen. We're also reminded in Psalm 139, verse 16, that all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. It's a promise that's made right after the testimony that I have been there during the creation. Lord, you formed me. You made me in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and I wonderfully made. And so when you think about that challenge, and then comes the promise right after that, all the days ordained for me, the days that God had numbered for Tunis to live, and the day that he would take him to glory was all marked out before he was even born. To know that assurance, and I always tell children, you know, when you write on the calendar, you put your own name, your own birthday on, right? Maybe you put your parents' birthday. Well, Jesus has a calendar to God has a calendar, and he writes every one of our names on that calendar on the day he's going to call us home. He just didn't tell us that. And that's a good thing, or we would live in fear. But we live in the assurance, as Tunis did, the assurance that Jesus Christ was real and that his hope and salvation was in Jesus Christ alone. Would you bow in prayer with me? Father, as we give thanks to you this morning, as we celebrate the life of one of your saints, one of your children, a sinner saved by grace, we want to know the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life, the assurance and the conviction and the, the confidence that we can walk in Jesus each and every day. And so we pray that you would add your blessing to us as we worship this morning, that you would receive it as thanksgiving from our hearts to yours, that you would enable us to use it as encouragement to one another. We pray especially, Father, for Phyllis and the children and the grandchildren and the extended family as they go through this time of parting, but also a time of looking forward to the future. So add your blessing to us as we worship together, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to be singing together, Christ is mine forever. If you would rise, please, while we sing.
Psalm 78, verses 1 through 6. O my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded his forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. The word that keeps coming to mind as I recall Dad's life is faithfulness. I could see it in the way he served the church. Dad served as deacon and elder many times, helped to start Pathway Ministries, and served there in many ways. I would see it in the way he was always willing to help out with youth group trips or serve on mission trips, even though some of the times I don't know Dad always helped in the approved way. There was one year he drove the youth group out to their mission trip in Montana. On the way back, he got off course, and the story is that he took advantage of the lack of speed limits in Montana. Dad was faithful to the church. I could see in the way Dad approached both of his careers. First at Dutton Christian, with his love of the students and always finding new ways to keep his classes engaged and entertained. The road rally lesson that Dad set up and loved so much, as far as I know, is still part of the fourth grade class at Dutton. And the faithfulness continued as Dad transitioned to in on time. I don't know if there was a route or trip that he ever refused. The other night as we were going through pictures to display, I saw an email that he had saved from his boss, Eric. It was a note from a customer saying the service that dad had provided during one week was the best they had ever received, and they looked forward to working with In On Time more in the future because of it. Dad's pride in his Dutch heritage was another way it could be seen. As kids, I remember yearly going to the Dutch festival and meeting Santa Claus every December. 
Later in life, each of us kids were able to go back to the Netherlands with mom and dad to see where he grew up and meet his family and friends. We don't think he ever went more than five years without going back to the Netherlands. And who could forget Old Year's Day Ole Bowman at Uncle Herm's? Dad was faithful to his Dutch heritage. It was also seen in the way he cared for us kids. Dad worked tirelessly to provide us with everything we needed, whether it be helping us with school projects, supporting or encouraging us in our sporting events, or helping us move and transition into new locations or homes. Dad was always there for us. I think of how involved he got with the Autism Society after adopting Lisa and learning of her autism diagnosis. For myself, it was Dad constantly talking about us, which then led to me getting an internship in college that has given me a career of 18 years. Dad was faithful to his kids. These last few years, it has been so encouraging to see Dad's faithfulness to Christ continue to grow. I would see it in his involvement with different small groups he and Mom were part of at church. I could see it in the Bible study group that became such a big part of his life. More times than not over the last few years, whenever I would stop by, Dad could be found reading scripture or a book on religion. Dad was faithful to Christ. Thank you, Dad, for teaching me how to live. Our dad was a traveler, a mover, a driver, a wanderer, a person always on the go. He was always willing to lend a hand with moving, driving people or things across the country. He moved me into two different Chicago apartments from Michigan, always insisting that he knew best how to load the truck, the moving van, the U-Haul, and always insisting that he was the driver. Dad loved driving and was always the one in the driver's seat. You never got to drive with him with dad. When you got into the car with him, he turned into tour guide mode and had to show you the sights. This is the house we used to snow plow. This is the house where we had this situation. This is the house mom and dad, not mom and I used to live in. He enjoyed being in the car on the road with anyone. He loved maps and exploring new places. This showed through his teaching at Dutton where he created the road rally project that they still use today. I remember when I was little, he tried to teach me a better sense of direction by forcing me to write everything down. We are heading west on 84th Street. We are heading north on Wilson. Those of you who know me know that all his work didn't quite pay off as I still have no natural sense of direction. He tried. Another memory the kids have is of dad always wanting to take the long way home. The long way home usually meant a much longer and very boring ride in the car, especially for those of us who are prone to car sickness. As kids, we used to hate the long ride home. But as an adult, I find myself doing that at times and to appreciate what dad loved. The slow drive to be off the beaten path, the chance to see a new route, the beauty of God's earth. Dad was passionate about travel and prone to wandering. Where's Tunis? Have you seen dad? Where did dad go? Were usually phrases uttered when traveling with him. He was curious and adventurous and always had to see everything and meet everyone. One memory I have is of a trip to Venice where he spent the time wandering. Mom and I barely saw him during our days there, but because he loved water and boats, Venice was his perfect place to wander. When I moved to Guatemala, Dad and Mom took Lisa to visit me. He was eager to immerse himself in my newly adopted home country and learn about it. He enjoyed meeting people, trying the foods, and seeing the sights. Since Guatemala isn't the safest country, though, we had to stifle his wandering a little bit. When I was considering my next overseas job, I looked at a bunch of places in the world, and Dad helped me with the difficult choice of selecting the next country and job. He asked me a series of questions, and at the end of it, he said, well, looks like you're moving to Turkey. Don't worry, we'll visit. And they did. Dad and Mom came to Istanbul and once again immersed themselves in my life, absorbing as much as they could on their visit. But most of all, Dad loved traveling to the Netherlands. He was so proud of his heritage, his country, the people. He prided himself on speaking Dutch and reading Dutch. 
He valued family, his ancestry, and made a point to return and connect with family every few years. Dad, I'm grateful that you passed on a love of learning, the desire to help people, and the curiosity and bravery to see the world. We know that you are in your eternal home and that you are happily wandering your days with Jesus. If you knew my dad at all, you knew he always had a song in his heart, and most of the time that song was coming out his mouth as well. We all grew up in a house where music was always playing. It was either blaring from Lisa's room or we were listening to dad's records, but that was just the beginning of it. It was not uncommon to be having a very simple conversation with dad and for him to randomly sing a tune that no one had ever heard of. But the best is he didn't just sing. He encouraged us as a family to sing as well. I remember that for a few years on Sundays, we as a family would go to a nursing home and sing to the residents. I'm sure as young children, we hated it. But that is one of the memories I will never forget. Dad, Dad's love for music led myself, Nathaniel, and Christina to join our school's honor choir. Natasha went on to join her high school and college choirs, and Lisa was no exception to singing as well. Music was a huge part of Dad's life, and that was certainly passed on to us kids. From a young age, Dad, was, Dad always wanted us to find our love for music. He introduced us to things like Nathaniel the Grublet, and Sylvania, and Music Machine. I'm sure none of you have ever heard these productions before, but if I played some right now, I guarantee you all of us would sing every single word. Dad always loved hymns. That was his jam. I remember thinking as a child to myself, wow, Dad, it's a little outdated. It's time to get with the times. But now I find myself annoying my wife and kids by singing hymns all the time. To be honest, that is the one sure way I can get my six-month-old daughter to calm down is to sing hymns to her. It works almost every time. Thanks, Dad, for passing that gift and that love down to me. For years, I can remember going to Chicago to listen to Uncle Herm's choir, the singing hymns. That was a trip we made many times. I always thought we were just going to support Uncle Herm, and it was an excuse for Dad to travel somewhere. But we found out that Dad really had a heart for that choir. And for over 20 years, he joined those men in singing God's praises. It was a Sunday tradition that Dad would sit down and eat dinner with us and rush out so he could make practice. Dad was a man of Christ and a man of music. He praised the Lord through song every single day and sometimes all day long. I'm sure the second he made it through those gates, he went right up and started singing with the heavenly choir. And when that day comes, when I get the chance to join him in heaven, I can't wait to stand next to him and sing the praises of our Lord and Savior. God blessed this man with a voice, and in return, he blessed us all by showing us how to sing praises to our Creator. Dad has this bumper sticker on the back of his van that says, too blessed to complain. He was blessed. Blessed with and by so many in his almost 75 years of life. So many things. And not only that, he was blessed. He was a blessing to so many people in so many unique and special ways. We have such fond memories of the fun, and some might say irresponsible, activities he did with us as children. One of those activities was the sled rides he took us on behind his plow truck. He would tie a sled or two behind the truck and pull us through the streets in the neighborhood. If someone fell off the sled, he would stop the truck, wait for us to climb back on, but all too often he would take off again just as you were sitting down. We would miss the sled, be left in the middle of the snowy road as the truck drove away with Dad laughing behind the steering wheel. 
He took us sledding at Byron Christian School and we would see how many people we could fit on a black inner tube and go spinning down the hill. He would plow giant piles of snow at the corner of the yard by the driveway for us to use to create our own snowmobiles or snow forts. We would play triominoes, Bible trivia, card games, or dice games together. Dad and Mom had a game night with Lisa and her staff on Sunday evenings. When he became an opa, we started to see his inner kid in a new way. He was constantly buying new toys for the grandkids to play with. We all quickly caught on to the fact that that was just an excuse to buy a toy that he also wanted to play with. He flew remote control airplanes in the living room with its high ceiling. The grandkids would stand in the control tower to help direct that helicopter and also stay safe in case Opa's pilot skills weren't so great that day. He swam in the pool with them for hours, tossing them in the air, having cannonball contests. They all loved it, no matter how many times they were dunked under the water. He filled water balloons for water balloon fights, sat on the steps and spun toy tops he bought in Guatemala for them, raced cars on the track in the basement, took them on scooter rides, flew kites, walked in the woods by the creek to search for frogs, pushed them around the yard on a two-wheel cart, but most of all, he enjoyed seeing the joy and laughter that play brings to the faces of children and adults. Our kids remember the donuts he brought them, the unlimited dropies he had at his home, his love of fish and seafood. These seemingly small things created such a unique, close relationship between him and his grandkids, one we will all cherish forever. To say he will be missed is an understatement. We will forever be thankful for him and his time with us, and we will continue to remember and talk about these special memories. We too are too blessed to complain, and because of Dad and Opa, we have been blessed with such wonderful memories and the desire to just play, laugh, and be a kid. Thank you, Lord, for our father and our Opa. And thank you, Dad. We love you. Thank you so much for sharing with us your memories. I think we all knew that whatever Kunis did, he did with gusto. He sang, he loved music. When he exercised, he exercised with vigor. In fact, the day before he went into surgery, he rode 10 miles on his bike to make sure his body was ready. That was Tunis. Brother's gonna sing for us at this time.
Thank you, men, for reminding us of that great truth of the Scriptures. Truly, it's not death to die when we die to life eternal, right? That's the awesomeness of it. I'm going to ask you just to bow in prayer a moment as we go to Scripture. Father, I want to thank you again for the challenge that your Word presents every day, for the assurance we have of the Lord Jesus Christ and the testimony that we know that those who believe in him Even though they die, yet shall they live, and living they shall never die. May we claim that truth this morning to us as we open the scriptures together. Give us your peace and give us your blessing from above, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'm going to share with you a passage that Tuna shared with his family very near the end of his life. It was from Psalm 73. It starts at verse 23, but I'm going to start just a few verses earlier at verse 17 because I want you to catch the flavor of what happens when you hear the yet. The first part of Psalm 73 is the psalmist looking around at the world and saying, why do they have it so good and I have it so bad? Oh, all these sinful people are so prosperous and here I am suffering through all these trials. As he comes to that moaning, then you hear it in 17 yet. Until I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their final destiny. Surely you placed them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed and completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. And you arise, O Lord, you despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant as a brute beast before you. And yet, and that's the change in the whole psalm, and yet I am always with you, and you hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you, And on earth I have nothing I desire besides. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For those who are far from you will perish, and you destroy all who are unfaithful. But as for me, it is good to be near unto God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all of your deeds. Life is full of contrast, isn't it, beloved? There's a contrast of walking through life when we look at young and youth and and the difference between age and and young people. When young people look at old people, they think, my, 60 years old and you're almost over the hill. When you get to be my age and you look at somebody that's 75, you think, boy, they're young yet. They're really doing great. Well, when are are you going to be old? Well, maybe when you get to be 90, but then we have a lady that's 99 and still goes to school and helps with school teaching. So you're not old until you grow old, but she hasn't grown old. And 
Tunis knew that young as he was, that he wasn't growing old either. Contrast is there again between black and white, and you put black next to brown, and you don't really notice it much, but when you put next to white, it really shows up what it really is. And in this psalm, it's the, con- the contrast is between the worldly man, and if you read the first part of that psalm, when you get home, you'll find out that he's really feeling bad about his life. He looks at the world and says, boy, they really got it made. They're rich, they're famous, they got all the great things in life. All the wonderful things are happening. And then all of a sudden, when I came to the house of God, yet changes the whole world. I have you think about that for a moment. Tunis wanted his children to know that he had no fear when he went into surgery. And so he read those words with them. I think it was in the parking lot by the hospital yet, wasn't it, that he read it to you. Those words, to hear that again, that testimony, that's really a a statement of confidence that he learned. Confidence that says, this is what life is all about. And yet for me, I have learned the secret that I can depend upon God. He is always with me. He holds me in in his hands and he will never let me go. And to be able to say that I'm held in the hand of God when I'm facing the reality of a very serious surgery, a surgery that would last 11 hours, and to hear the reality, yet I'm in the hand of God. And he was there in that operating room. And he was there afterwards. The recovery was going well. And yet I am in the hand of God as, as he looked forward to life. He was coming home soon until God had other plans. Confidence that says, though, the fullness is there. The awesomeness of it all stands true. And when he hears that, Lord, you're my God. You hold me in your hands. And then afterwards, you will take me to glory. He did not anticipate that this week. We did not anticipate this week. In fact, when I called Phyllis, I wanted to know what day he was coming home the first time. And she said, well, things have changed a little bit last night. It's probably going to be next week instead. Things had changed because God had a plan that he had not yet revealed. And as we walk through that plan together, we know the reality that he holds us in his hands. And afterwards, you will take me into glory. It's a promise Jesus made, isn't it, in John 14. I'm going to my father and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when I am ready, I will come and take you to be with me. There's that assurance, is there? That he took Tunis home. A lot of people say, well, he called him home. That's not the promise Jesus made. Jesus said, when I am ready, when the place is prepared, when the room is ready, when everything is ready for you, and I have prepared you to be with there, I will come and I will take you home. It's like the shepherd of the Old Testament coming, carrying the lamb in his arms, bringing him home, bringing him to the fold, bringing him where he needs to be. So Christ carries us to that home where there's praise and celebration in the Father's house. And so confidence gives way to confession. A confession that stands so strong in those verses. Whom have I in heaven but you? There's no greater way. There's no way of salvation. We hear so much about, oh, anybody who really lives a good moral life is going to go to to glory. That's not true. Unless you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, unless you confess him as the Lord of life and yield your life to him, you're not going to go to heaven. It's as simple as that. The word is strong. The word is true. There is no other name given uh, among men when men can come except the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Tunis believed that with his whole heart. What he did, he did with gusto. What he did with excitement. When he sang, he sang from his heart. and His whole countenance reflected it. But he had that concentration, that confession, 
of an anticipated joy that we all have that one day I will see Jesus face to face. One of my grandchildren asked me, Grandpa, how long are you going to live? And he expected me to tell him I'm going to live to be an old man or I'm going to live to be this. And I said, I'm going to live to be as old as God wants me to be. That word that I reminded you at the beginning, all of the days of our life are written on his book before one of them came to be. That's the story that is, is ours in its totality. The reality that we know the blessing of God through it all. Faith finds victory in Jesus Christ. Whom have I in heaven but you? And yet, I have the reality that earth's desire fades. Being with you, I desire nothing on earth besides. Tunis loved his children, but he loved his wife more. Phyllis Tunis loved you completely, but he loved his Lord more. And that's nothing to be ashamed of. Because you walk together, hand in hand, in the assurance of forgiveness of sins, in the reality of the fullness of life, in the expression of love that, that just was done with gusto as well. Testimony continues. My heart and my flesh may fail. He didn't realize that was happening at that moment until that time of crisis really began. My heart and my flesh may fail. And all of a sudden, things changed for us, but not for God's plan. Happening exactly as the Father had planned. A place prepared. A home going anticipated. A challenge of reality. My heart, my flesh may fail. Well, what more can I expect then? What can I look forward to? I can look forward to a home in heaven. The reality sets in as we grow older. Our focus is sometimes on our frailty and our health issues. And yet comes that possibility for each of us. And yet. We've been talking for a moment about the old, and what's going to happen to us. We're going to die, we know that. We're going to have to face Jesus. But what about the young? What about those who are facing the reality of gusto and leave the home before they ever think about another day in life? I was a young pastor. I was 24 years old when I was ordained, and in my church there were some young people that we got along fine with, and we We did a lot of different things together. And four of them got together on an evening and decided to go roller skating. A 16-year-old, two 15-year-old, and a 14-year-old. Little did they think when they left home and said goodbye to their dad and their barn and the mother in the house that they would not come home again. But God had other plans. The greatest joy that I could say to those parents as we stood like we are today, I'll tell you what Jerry told me on Friday afternoon in a, Catholic, in, a, in a class setting. He said, Pastor, I want you to know I know Jesus as my Savior. I know I'm trusting him completely. Seven o'clock that night, he met him face to face along with his brother and his two girlfriends. Are you ready? Whether you're young or old, are you ready? If that should be what God asked of you today, are you ready to be with me? That's the confession you and I have to make. But then comes that commitment, a commitment of shared strength, isn't it? Not just a a confidence, not just a confession, but a a commitment that says God is the strength of of my heart, my very core being, the very in part of me that makes me all of him as my body weakens. And the contrast becomes no, more noticeable. Life is really a matter of heart relationship with Jesus Christ. That, that relationship that you and I must experience each and every day. With the challenge that one of you boys asked your dad about the night 
that, that things weren't going so good. Dad, are you ready to be with the Lord? And he said, I am totally ready. I hope that's your testimony to each other today. Are you ready to be with the Lord? Are you ready to be with the Lord? The singing hymns were a very strong part of Tunis's life, and they, they have an impact in my ministry. Several years ago, I was in my church, and we were getting ready for church, and the singing hymns were there that night. And just before I walked out the door of my home to go to church, there was a terrible accident right in front of my house. An elderly couple from my congregation were coming to worship, and they were hit broadside. And the lady was, in, was injured, and, and as we dealt with it, I went into church, and I got some help, and pretty soon the fire chief came in and said, I want you to know she's on her way to the hospital, but things don't look well. The singing hymns were singing, and a little while later, they got to do their second set, and while they were doing their second set of songs, the fire chief came back down the aisle and got me out, and he said, I just want you to know she passed away on the, Lord, uh, on the way to the hospital. She saw Jesus face to face. That night, not by coincidence, by God's direction, that night I was preaching on what is heaven going to be like? Are you really ready to be there? There was no greater illustration than I could give. But I want to ask you that today. I reminded the family of that outdoors when Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus and he told them, I am the resurrection and the life. He that comes to me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? I want to ask you that today. Do you believe this? Do you really believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life? You realize that's all. And then comes that testimony, that awesome commitment that says, God is my strength in my heart. God is my portion forever. The Old Testament in Psalm 16, we read that promise, and all the property lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a goodly inheritance. And Tunis says, given to you as children, and as grandchildren, a goodly inheritance. If he could give you nothing else, if we get to that point in life where we all pass away, uh, all of the things we own pass away, maybe we like Job, we, maybe we will have lost the possessions, maybe we will have lost family, maybe we will have lost health. But can you say with Job, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Now blessed be the name of the Lord. And we can say that even this past week. The Lord gave. He gave Tunis life. He gave him life for several, several years, several decades. He gave him the gusto of life. The Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, it's our prayer that you would be with us in this afternoon time. That you would help us to see the reality of what it's all about. To know the strength and joy that's there, that we have that good promise that for us it's good to be near unto God. And that we can have that exciting response of looking at a world of sin and saying, but that's not for me, that's not where I want to be at, that's not the joy that I need. So help us to realize the fullness of it all. We know, Lord, things don't just happen. They're planned, planned according to your will. And so give us your peace, we pray. Amen. i just share one poem with you before we go to a song, and that's this. It's the last prayer that I just ushered. Things don't just happen, they're planned. Things don't just happen to us who love God. They're planned by his all own dear hand. They're molded and shaped and timed by his clock. Things don't just happen, they're planned. We don't just guess on the issues of life. We Christians just rest in the Lord. We're directed by his sovereign will in the light of his holy word. We who love Jesus are walking by faith, not seeing one step that's ahead, not doubting one moment what others' lots might be, but looking to Jesus instead. We praise our dear Savior for loving us so, for planning each care of our life, 
than giving us faith to trust him for all, the blessings as well as the strife. Things don't just happen to us who love God, to us who have taken our stand, no matter the lot, the course of the price. Things don't just happen, they're planned. Let's rise and sing, Abide With Me. Ever ask that question? I wonder what heaven's like. I wonder what Tunis is doing right now, what he's experiencing. We don't have to guess about that. It's revealed in the scriptures. It's in Revelation 7. I just want to read a few verses from there with you. And after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation and tribe and people and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders asked me, these in the white robes, who are they? Where do they come from? And I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they that have come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robe and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will never spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Last week, that question was asked again. This one in white robe. Who is he? Where did he come from? 
And the answer was given. He has come out of the great tribulation. And he has washed his robe and made it white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, Tunis is before the throne of God, serving him day and night in his temple. Praise be to God. Let's bow in prayer together. Now, Lord, we pray that you would give us strength and blessing as we go from here today. That you would give us the assurance of your grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. That you give us that confidence of hope that for each of us there's that triumph of grace that we can experience in our life as well. Give us peace and joy and celebration as we go on our homeward way. Help us to experience the love of the Lord Jesus Christ as we walk with him and as we talk with him, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Receive now the benediction of the Lord rising, and then we remain standing for the singing of By the Sea of Crystal. Just a reminder that the family only will be going to the cemetery. It's a family only where we're going to the grave, and we will be doing the internment there. Receive now the blessing of the Lord. Now may the grace of Almighty God be yours. May the love of the Lord Jesus Christ fill your hearts and minds. May the blessing of the Holy Spirit give you strength, peace, and joy and assurance always through all of your life, throughout your day, throughout your week. Amen. Amen.